You're listening to The Cultured Bumpkin, a literature podcast with Jake Phillips, where we present audiobook quality readings of the classics for your enjoyment. Thank you for stopping by. And remember, just because you're a bumpkin doesn't mean you can't be cultured. Hello and welcome to The Cultured Bumpkin. I'm Jake. So on this episode, we're going to uh, read from a kind of an old book, and uh, it's from the 1890s, and it's called From Chaucer to Tennyson. It's by Henry Beers, a professor of English literature uh, at Yale back in, uh, I guess, the the 1800s. And um, this ended up as a book in the uh, Monte Vista, Colorado High School. (laughs) And then I picked it up at a little bookshop in Lake City for eight bucks. And it's great. So I'm going to read from this uh, just a little bit because I was fascinated by the history. And then we'll read from uh, sort of a modern version of Chaucer's uh, The Prologue to the Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. And then I'll leave a link that if you want to go look at the kind of the original spelling, uh, you can do that. So... That'll be how that'll go. So, obviously, uh, the conquest of England, a turning point in England, is the year 1066. The Norman conquest of England. Um, It it made a break with the natural growth of the English language and literature. The Old English, or Anglo-Saxon, had been a purely Germanic speech with a complicated grammar and a full set of inflections. For 300 years following the Battle of Hastings, this native tongue was driven from the king's court and the courts of law, from parliament, school, and university. During all this time, there were two languages spoken in England. Norman French was the birth tongue of the upper classes, and English of the lower. When the latter got the better of the struggle and became, about the middle of the 14th century, the national speech of all England, it was no longer the English of King Alfred. He was a king from about, uh, I think it was like eight, around eight, uh, middle of the ninth century, late ninth century, something like that. I think he lived from 850 to 900, somewhere in there. It was a new language, a grammarless tongue almost wholly stripped of its inflections. It had lost half of its old words and had filled their places with French equivalents. The Norman lawyers had introduced legal terms, the ladies and courtiers, words of dress and courtesy. The knight had imported the vocabulary of war and of the chase. The master builders of the Norman castles and cathedrals and keeps contributed technical expressions proper to the architect and the masons. The art of cooking was French. The naming of the animals, ox, swine, sheep, deer, was left to the Saxon churl who had been herding them, while the dressed meats, beef, pork, mutton, venison, received their baptism from the table talk of his Norman master. The four orders of begging friars, and especially the Franciscans, or Grey Friars, introduced into England in 1224, became intermediaries between the high and the low. They went about preaching to the poor, and in their sermons they intermingled French with English. In their hands, too, was almost all the science of the day. Their medicine, botany, and astronomy displaced the old nomenclature of leechdom, wart cunning, and starcraft. And finally, the translators of French poems often found it easier to transfer a foreign word bodily than to seek out a native synonym, particularly when the former supplied them with a rhyme. But the innovation reached even to the commonest words in everyday use, so that voice drove out Stephen, poor drove out Irm, and color, use, and place made good their footing beside hue, want, and stead. A great part of the English words that were left were so changed in spelling and pronunciation as to be practically new. Chaucer stands in date midway between King Alfred and Alfred Tennyson, but his English differs vastly more from the former's than it does from the latter's. To Chaucer, Anglo-Saxon was as much a dead language as it is to us. The classical Anglo-Saxon, moreover, had been the Wessex dialect spoken and written at Alfred's capital, Winchester. When the French had displaced this as the language of culture, there was no longer a king's English or any literary standard. 
The sources of modern standard English are to be found in the East Midland, spoken in Lincoln, Norfolk, Suffolk, Cambridge, and neighboring shires. Here, the old Anglian had been corrupted by the Danish settlers and rapidly threw off its inflections when it became a spoken and no longer a written language after the conquest. The West Saxon, clinging more tenaciously to ancient forms, sank into the position of a local dialect, while the East Midland, spreading to London, Oxford, and Cambridge, became the literary English in which Chaucer wrote. So we are going to read a again, modernized version of the general prologue uh, from the Canterbury Tales. Okay, so, and I'll leave a link in the show notes so you can go um, to where there's a side-by-side. -side. So there's a modern English next to the, the Middle English. All right, and then, um, and remember, Middle English goes up to about 1450. So when things, when people call um, uh, Shakespeare or the King James Bible Old English, they don't know their history, okay? That's uh, at best early modern. So this is squarely, Chaucer is squarely Middle English, and I think everybody uh, agrees on that one. So anyway, here it is. Language is so fascinating. When April with his showers sweet with fruit... The drought of March has pierced unto the root and bathed each vein with liquor that has power to generate therein and sire the flower. When Zephyr also has, with his sweet breath, quickened again in every holt and heath, the tender shoots and buds and the young sun into the ram one half his course has run, and many little birds make melody that sleep through all the night with open eye, so nature pricks them on to ramp and rage, then do folk long to go on pilgrimage, and palmers to go seeking out strange strands, to distant shires well known in sundry lands. And specially from every shire's end of England they to Canterbury wind, the holy blessed martyr there to seek, who helped them when they lay so ill and weak. Befell that in that season on a day in Southwark at the Tabard, as I lay ready to start upon my pilgrimage to Canterbury, full of devout homage, there came at nightfall to that hostelry some nine and twenty in a company of sundry persons who had chanced to fall in fellowship, and pilgrims were they all that toward Canterbury town would ride. The rooms and stables spacious were and wide, and well we were there eased and of the best. And briefly, when the sun had gone to rest, so had I spoken with them every one, that I was of their fellowship anon, and made agreement that we'd early rise to take the road, as you and I will apprise. But none the less, whilst I have time and space, before yet farther in this tale I pace, it seems to me accordant with reason to inform you of the state of every one of all of these, as it appeared to me, and who they were, and what was their degree, and even how arrayed there at the end, and with a night thus will I first begin." A knight there was, and he a worthy man, who from the moment that he first began to ride about the world loved chivalry, truth, honor, freedom, and all courtesy. Full worthy was he in his liege lord's war, and therein had he ridden, none more far, as well in Christendom as heathenness, and honored everywhere for worthiness. At Alexandria he, when it was won, full off the table rosters he'd begun, above all nations, knights, and Prussia. In Latvia raided he, and Russia, no christened man so oft of his degree. In far Granada at the siege was he of Algeciras, and at Belmarie. At Ayas was he, and at Satelye, when they were won, and on the middle sea at many a noble meeting chanced to be. Of mortal battles he had fought fifteen, and he'd fought for our faith at Tramacene, three times in lists, and each time slain his foe. This self-same worthy knight had been also at one time with the lord of Palatye, against another heathen in Turkey, and always won he sovereign fame for prize. Though so illustrious, he was very wise, and bore himself as meekly as a maid. He never yet had any vileness said in all his life to whatsoever white. He was a truly perfect, gentle knight." But now, to tell you all of his array, his steeds were good, but yet he was not gay. 
of simple fustian wore he a japon sadly discolored by his habergian for he had lately come from his voyage and now he was going on this pilgrimage with him there was his son a youthful squire a lover and a lusty bachelor with locks well curled as if they'd lain in press some twenty years of age was he i guess in stature he was of an average length, wondrously active, aye, and great of strength. He'd ridden some time with the cavalry in Flanders, in Artois, and Picardy, and borne him well within that little space, in hope to win thereby his lady's grace. Prinked out he was, as if he were a mead, all full of fresh-cut flowers, white and red. Singing he was, or fluting all the day, he was as fresh as the month of May. Short was his gown, with sleeves long and wide, well could be sit on horse and fairly ride. He could make songs and words thereto indite, joust and dance too, as well as sketch and write. So hot he loved that while night told her tale, he slept no more than does a nightingale. Courteous he and humble, willing and able, and carved before his father at the table. A yeoman had he, nor more servants, no, at that time, for he chose to travel so. And he was clad in coat and hood of green, a sheaf of peacock arrows bright and keen under his belt he wore right carefully. Well could he keep his tackle yeomanly. His arrows had no draggled feathers low, and in his hand he bore a mighty bow. A cropped head had he and a sun-browned face, a woodcraft knew he all the useful ways. Upon his arm he bore a bracer gay, and at one side a sword and buckler yea, and at the other side a dagger bright, well sheathed and sharp as spear point in the light. On breast a Christopher of silver sheen, he bore a horn in baldric all of green. A forester he truly was, I guess. All right, that was, uh, that's... That's the prologue, or at least a large portion of it. I'm not exactly sure if that's the whole thing, but that is the modern reading of the Canterbury Tales general prologue. And uh, that is a very old piece of uh, literature right there. It's just so cool that we're still talking about Chaucer and his characters. So it was written well over 600 years ago, at the end of the 1300s, right around the time that John Wycliffe was uh, translating the Latin Vulgate into English. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of good literature being, being written in England in the, uh, the late 1300s. So anyway, uh, there's a little history about the transformation of the English language, the enriching of the English language by, by uh, other languages. It's been said that uh, English is like a, a mugger in an alley that... Um, sort of mugged several languages and rifled through its pockets for new words. And um, I think that's very interesting to learn about. And if you like classic literature audiobooks, uh, send me an email at theculturedbumpkin at gmail.com. All right, and just say, hey, when you come out with a new audiobook, make sure I know about it. Send me an email, and I'll email you a link to it. Uh, obviously, I won't uh, send a lot of emails from it, but... Uh, when I put out a new, like a full-length audiobook, like I'm working on Persuasion by Jane Austen, Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, when I get them all the way up, you know, I can let you know. So uh, send me your email address to theculturedbumpkin at gmail.com, and I will uh, make sure I let you know when I have a new one out. So thank you very much for listening. You've been listening to The Cultured Bumpkin, a literature podcast with Jake Phillips. Thank you very much for listening. I really do appreciate it. If you enjoyed this, would you mind going and subscribing and leaving a nice review on whatever podcast platform podcast platform you heard this on? I would really appreciate it. Thank you very much for listening and we'll see you next time.